Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is Tanya Reese. Tanya is a senior vice president at Edelman and executive director of Edelman Square. Square serves as the steward for intellectual property across what is recognized today as the largest public relations firm in the world. Tanya's work at Square ensures that its intellectual properties have consistent standards for quality and rigor and practical application for its practices, geographies, and clients. Square provides signature IP studies and smaller evidence-based reports. Among them are the Edelman Trust Barometer and the Edelman Earned Brand Study. We welcome Tanya to the show. Tanya, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here on uh, Year of the Peer. I'm such a big fan of the Edelman Trust Barometer and, of course, the agency as well. I mean, Edelman is certainly um, you know, an incredible uh, global firm uh, that's shown a lot of leadership in a lot of areas. And, uh, again, I think the Trust Barometer, uh, as you know, uh, I reference it a lot in talks that I have and workshops that I have to talk about not only the power of peers, but since you've been doing this Edelman Trust Barometer in 2001, we've seen the power of peers uh, grow in importance and grow in credibility. So uh, first, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself to everyone and let us know uh, a little more about your responsibilities at Edelman, and we'll get into the Trust Barometer and um, kind of what that's all about, and we'll go from there. Great, Leo. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to join you on this podcast. Um, and yes, Edelman uh, is remarkable for many things, including the fact that it invests as much as it does in these um, industry-leading uh, thought leadership research pieces. Uh, the Trust Barometer is the most notable one. Uh, 17 years of collecting data on trust levels and in institutions, and the story only gets more interesting every year. Um, we also do a consumer study that is a global annual tracking study called Earned Brand, which looks at the changing relationship between consumers and brands, um, and peer voices have a lot to do with those changes as well. So I have a very fun job, which is that I get to look after uh, all of this IP. I partner closely with our research, um, our in-house research team at Edelman Intelligence. And uh, the way I explain my job to my mother is my uh, my job is not to actually do the research. My, my job is to make sure that people love the research, which means um, telling a story with it, uh, making it clear, keeping it simple, and, but above all, making sure we're, we're asking the right kinds of questions about interesting topics. So it's, oh, great. it's a great job. Well, and I know, of course, as I mentioned, you've been doing this trust barometer since 2001. If you could give us some of the highlights of the 2017 results, uh, we can kind of springboard from there. It would be great. Uh, sure. Well, the 2017 results come directly out of a very interesting insight we found in 2016, the previous year, um, which is that uh, it's, it's, let's say it's just probably not the first time that we have written a questionnaire to look at a specific topic. So every year about half of the survey is repeated uh, in order to track trends long term. And then we get to use this, this space in the other half to do a deep dive on a topic. And the goal that year had been to look at trust in CEOs. But then when the data came back, we found something very remarkable, which is that the difference between the trust levels, between what we call our informed public, uh, higher educated, higher income, uh, and regular readers of business and policy news, right? Um, have always been higher than the trust levels for everyone else in the general population, right? right. But what we found in 2016 is that mm. that gap between the informed public and the mass population had grown by a significant amount in the previous three to five years to a point where we dropped everything else we were doing and said, we need to understand what is happening here. So in 2016, our focus was on trust inequality 
And then in 2017, the most recent report, we did a deep dive on um, essentially what turned out to be populism. We looked at what is the percentage of people who feel that the system is truly broken, that it is not giving them a fair shake, that they don't have, um, that it's stacked against them, right? That those in the know have an unfair advantage. And then how is that combining with fears around different societal concerns, whether it's globalization or the pace of change is going too fast, or we haven't thought through the impact of immigration and the refugee crisis and how, you know, I'm afraid of corruption. Um, and how are those fears intersecting with a loss of trust in the institutions to protect me and to give me an even playing field in order to create um, really a, 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 you know, a populist action of some kind, right? Whether it's something that we're seeing in the voting results or in other behaviors that people will take. Um, and as you can imagine, it was very, very timely. We did post-election surveys in the U.S., uh, in the UK, looking, comparing Brexit voters to non-Brexit voters. We looked at the re, um, election in France um, and the, uh, the, you know, the impact that this la lack of trust in institutions has when people feel that the established way of doing things is not working for them. Um, and when you've got especially that sense of the elites don't get it. You know, the establishment is not listening to me, is not hearing my voice. And guess what? Consumers today and people today have much better sense that their voice can and should be heard and they have the tools to make themselves hit hurt. And I think that's why your topic of the year of the peer is so relevant, you know, in this year, because um, in an era when I can get on Facebook or on Twitter and talk to people directly, I don't necessarily need institutions or leaders to be my mouthpiece. Um, right. And those leaders who understand how to speak directly with you and how to participate in that conversation suddenly are the ones who are upending the apple cart in many, in many respects. And we think that has a lot of profound implications for business and government alike. Well, it's interesting, too, because I know that that gap um, grew to 15 percent among the 28 countries globally, but that it was actually higher than that, of course, in the three countries you mentioned, right, in the U.S., uh, the UK and France, and we saw that play out uh, in the election, certainly. Um, what's interesting, though, too, is um, I know one of the other headlines, of course, was that uh, trust did drop uh, in all four uh, institutions you looked at, right? Business, government, media, uh, and NGOs. Uh, business, interestingly enough, is kind of holding its own up there with NGOs, and I think that may be in large part to some of what you uncovered back in 2010 uh, and all when business really saw itself as being, uh, as the important thing was to be part of the solution. Not, so they worked on trust. Yes. I mean, and, uh, and I think we're seeing a little bit of the uh, effects of that. But of course, with media and, uh, and, gov and government, it's uh, pretty, um, pretty rough numbers there. And uh, I think to your point, when we don't trust institutions, we're going to look to one another um, for you know, for answers or advice like we do when we go online and all that. What, what's interesting, though, is on one hand, we do that, and we do that pretty well, right? Whether it's Amazon reviews or things like that, we don't know these people from Adam. We know we have a shared interest, and we will uh, trust the kind of collective sentiment, you know, uh, as an important data point um, as we look at um, all this. Um, at the same time, though, in, in politics, because things have become so bifurcated, we don't listen to one another very well anymore either. <laughs> so I'm wondering how we can maybe reconcile that because not only in many cases as government, you know, um, you could argue at a, at a standstill, um, you know, uh, publicly we're not doing a very good job, I think, with one another in terms of listening and hearing point of views and listening for understanding. So I'd love to get some of your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, and we had, we had a little bit of data looking at the, um, the notion of the echo chamber. I'm sure most of uh, your listeners will be familiar with that, uh, but it's, it's definitely something that really intrigues us, which is why actually the, the next questionnaire, the 2018 Trust Barometer, is going to be doing a deep dive exactly on that topic, the topic of the media, um, the challenges that the media is facing as an as an institution, fake news, you know, and, and the extent to which people, you know, uh, 
retweet things they already agree with and just ignore things that they don't agree with. Um, and that's really what the data showed is that people are much more likely to engage with content that already supports something that they believe in. Um, so that, that phenomenon is real. Um, I think, and now I'm going into the land of opinion and hypothesis uh, <laughs> rather than data, but I do think part of, first of all, that this is one of the big questions of our time. You know, one of the big challenges that, that we, those of us in the communications business in writ large, uh, I think increasingly the technology industry as well has very much a role in helping us answer these questions, right? We, you know, we've spent the last five to 10 years gearing up to be great at this attention economy, you know, where attention is the currency, uh, but what is lost in that is quality of information, you know, and thoughtfulness and mindfulness, mm -hmm. and, and how do we maybe get a little bit of that back? Um, I think part of the answer is that facts alone are not going to change someone's mind and someone's opinion, right? They need to be fact. They need to be factual and accurate. Yes, but it also needs to be a great story and a narrative, right? That and a narrative that is as compelling, if not more so, than the one that people already have bought into. Um, and that's really the only way that you're truly going to sway opinion and change hearts and minds. Um, and how you do that? How you do story? in an era where everything is bite-sized and fast and reduced down to, you know, one Twitter feed where everything you know, is really tough. That's a big question. Have you, looked, have, you, have you looked at this generationally also? Like the idea that, in other words, are millennials um, able to actually engage in dialogue better than boomers are? Or, you know, where people tend to be entrenched and where uh, someone watches Fox, someone watches MSNBC, and they get their, you know, cocktail party quotes that they can kind of, uh, you know, use. And, you know, they don't really engage very well. We're certainly not listening to one another in that way. Um, so do you find any differences across generations or not really? You know, the problem is that while... The, there's significant differences in the platforms that the generations use. And yes, you know, a boomer is more likely to be watching TV and on Fox, uh, while a millennial is more likely to be online. Um, that's, that's a given. But just because somebody's getting their information online, whether it's on Snapchat or, you know, YouTube, doesn't necessarily mean that they're hearing a diverse range of voices, right? Because the content they're seeing is self-selected based on pre-existing interests and likes, or it's fed to them by an algorithm that is also based on you know, pre-existing pre behavior or, or previous behavior. So that doesn't, the fact that millennials tend to be online more doesn't necessarily mean they're more exposed to diverse voices. You know, and I wonder sometimes if we're not always, I, like I know myself and people, and you know, certainly in my generation were kind of taught by your parents when you're engaging other people in conversation, whatever you do, don't talk about religion and politics and you stay away from these subjects that, um, and, and I'm wondering if that isn't like really bad advice. Like what if as young kids, we were actually um, more wired to have conversations about anything and really listen to one another, really engage in a conversation about somebody's faith or somebody's politics because we really care about where they come from and what that looks and feels like in, in order to educate one another as opposed to feel as if it's all about winning the argument or uh, become, you know, entrenched in debate. I'm not sure what you, what you think about that, but... I'm, I'm vigorously nodding my head, as you can see, and uh, others can't. I, um, <laughs> I couldn't agree more that it's, it's it, you know, too many topics are taboo, which means that we don't learn how to talk about them in a way that is civil or intellectually curious or, or respectful. Um, you know, the, the other thing that's, to me, a troubling trend in this culture, and, and one of the reasons that the 2017 Trust Barometer found for the first time that a person like yourself is now as credible on any topic as an expert is. Uh, whether it's an academic expert or a technical expert. And I actually went back and looked at the trend lines on that um, to see, okay, you know, what's the increase been in uh, peer credibility? And the, what I found is that peer credibility has actually been 
flat at about 60%, it's trust in experts that has declined. Interesting. Right, so academic and technical experts are less credible today than they were five years ago, say. And as a result, what a regular person says is now as believable as what an expert says. So there's this sort of anti-intellectualism or a loss of respect for experts and education uh, that may be well deserved, right? Because it could well be that the experts, and you know, let's say that I am an expert on trust or I'm an expert on communication, hmm. but maybe I have not done a really good job of staying connected to you know how people really think about communication today, right? Just because I have a lot of research does not necessarily make me an expert. Um, and so I think that's been a challenge for for you know experts are kind of having to rethink whether it's how they present the data uh, that they have or how they present their opinions or what, what it's based on. Um, but there's a, there's a real distrust of expertise and intellectualism right now as, as part of the culture as well. Um, and, and I think I find that troubling too. So let's talk about the implications of that for CEOs because one of the things that I see is that if peers do enjoy a level of credibility, and I, I saw CEO trust was basically down across the board, even in uh, countries where the CEO is actually pretty well trusted. Um, it was kind of interesting to see that. It, it seems like CEOs kind of took the hit with institutions, right, with regard to why um, their credibility is where it is. But it also makes me think that if I'm a CEO and I want to launch an initiative in my company and I want to get support from it, then communicating vertically through your organization is one thing. Understanding key influences and communicating across my organization so I can leverage this peer credibility as people get together in these sense-making exercises of what do we what do we think about this, right? They don't just process it by themselves. Um, so what do CEOs have to do to help communicate across their organization more effectively as opposed to just communicating down? That's a great question. Um, and, and yes, we think that you need to really shift your thinking from talking to or at people to talking with people, right? So conversational approach to everything. How do you give people a voice to participate in a conversation versus just pushing content at them? And the most valuable asset that you have um, is your employee base. Right? Many companies have hundreds of thousands of employees, all of whom in the right circumstances are ready to be your advocate right? and to take whatever the message is and explain it to their friends and family um, or, or stand up for it or put it in their own words, which is going to make it more credible and more believable. So um, we think that you know, this, there's a whole new era of what used to be internal communications Right, which really has to focus on how do I activate my employee base? How do I get them excited? How do I bring them into the fold in a way that they own the message and can take it out, um, out to the world? Um, and then the other thing that we, um, we think is important from a CEO perspective, right? Yes, people want to hear from CEOs, but what they really want to hear from CEOs is what are your values? Right? What are the motivations that are, you know, we just, we're going to tune you out because you're rich, you're out of touch, you make too much money, and everything you do is financially motivated anyway. Oh, wait, you have another reason to care? Okay, tell me about that reason. Right? So from, from a CEO, and I think from institutions as well, people are looking, um, looking to understand more what your motivation is, what drives you, what are your values, because um, I can find out all that other stuff on the internet, right? But who you are as a person, I can only hear from you. And that's where most CEOs don't necessarily open up, um, you know, keep it focused on the numbers, um, and they've lost their audience. Tell me a little bit about yourself, your personal background, your history, and what makes you credible, and most importantly, why do you care? You know, other than making money, is there a reason that you care? Tell me about that and you'll be more credible. You know, uh, one of the things that is so interesting to me too is um, there's the trust barometer. Of course, there's some other studies that you've mentioned as well that you said also, you know, have some implications around peers. But I would also imagine that this does a lot to inform 
how and what areas to focus on in terms of counseling your clients, I would imagine, correct? I mean, you, you, you uh, that so much of the intellectual property that you're uh, involved with can help you stay on top of, um, you know, I think not only specific trends, but real areas of concentration um, for CEOs, for business leaders, and for communicators, so, to be fair. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the thought leadership, the idea is for this to be um, conversation starters, right? And to mm. really have a point of view on important issues. Um, but to the extent that it can then provide actionable guidance as to what are the steps you can take to address those issues, um, to help us be more confident in the recommendations that we're making to companies, um, it's, that's a real win for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, tell me a little uh, about, you said there was another um, study that was, I think it was on, on Brandt, uh, correct? That, right. You know, also had some findings that you said were relevant on the peer-to-peer -peer front. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So the trust barometer looks at the, the trust that people have in businesses as institutions. Um, earned brand looks at the relationship that they have with brands, right? The things that they actually know that they use every day. Um, as opposed to, you know, business as sort of an idea, right? How do I feel about my relationship with my favorite brand in a given category? And then we ask you to describe that relationship you have with that brand, and we score it across seven dimensions and give you um, a score on an index. And what we found, um, we were actually, the first year that we did this index, that we measured this brand relationship, we were completely blown away at how much farther consumers were willing to go in a brand relationship than many brands even realized, hmm. right? So this is not a, a huge percentage. Uh, the average brand is at a 37, which is what we call the involved relationship stage. Um, and that's one where historically brands would be pretty happy, right? At that stage, I understand that you have more than a product and service, but that you stand for something, and I appreciate that you stand for that, and I'm maybe even willing to pay a little bit of a premium to get that brand, right? And most brand marketers would be really happy. But what we discovered is that there's also an invested stage and a committed stage. Uh, and about 10% of all consumer brand relationships are at the committed stage. And what happens once you get past involved into invested and committed, it goes from being a me and you relationship to a we relationship. Mm. Right? We see the world the same way. We share common interests and beliefs. Um, and then at the committed stage, it goes from values and beliefs to actually action. We go, we, not only do we see the world in the same way, but we do things together in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So how brands that I choose are one of the ways that I make a difference in the world, for instance, right? And then this year we looked at um, that a little bit more deeply and we discovered that about half of the audience, half of the general population, half of consumers can be classified as what we call belief-driven buyers, mm -hmm. where Brands' values is one of the ways that they either, you know, choose or reject a brand. Um, they'll choose to pay a premium based on those beliefs. Um, and that especially, you asked earlier about younger generations, you know, especially among millennials and Gen mm -hmm. Z, that is a huge phenomenon um, with the majority of millennials by making buying decisions that way. So people are buying and boycotting brands based on their beliefs. And 30% said that, that they're buying and boycotting more more today than they used to. So we're seeing that sort of increased polarized climate that we see in the trust barometer is playing out for brands as well. And in some cases creating um, a lot of opportunity because a lot of people will, will buy a new brand for the first time solely based on its beliefs, but it's also creating a lot of challenges and, you mm -hmm. know, just for instance. The, the, the values, no, the values piece uh, makes a lot of sense because when I think also about brands that, um, like a brand I use every day might be my car, a brand right. that I may use very infrequently. Maybe I only take one or two trips a year, but somehow uh, an airline has the ability to establish a relationship with me or we, you, we are aligned in values in such a way where 
there's actually still a relationship despite the infrequency of the use versus something that I might use every single day. And you could see um, where that values component of it has to weigh into it pretty heavily, I would imagine. Well, absolutely, because the, re and the reason the relationship is so important is not only are you going to perhaps pay a premium or be a more loyal buyer, but you're also going to be more of an advocate for that brand. You're going to engage with it more on, on social media, for instance, and you're going to defend that brand if you see it being criticized. Mm. You know, um, oh, a, a little broken mm. antenna problem? No problem. They'll fix it. Right? Absolute faith. In that it's going to get fixed, you know, because it's Apple. Um, and, and Apple fans will not only die on the, you know, but they will <laughs> go do battle in public on behalf of their brand. No, no, um, no, no, and no. so at a time where that pure voice is so much more influential than anything you might ever say on an advertisement, um, you know, that is a huge asset for brands, um, that they really need to cultivate those relationships, especially with those people who are more inclined to speak up and um, and so beliefs and values play a huge part in that because that's one of the things that gets people talking right I, I love to have opinions about you know how to make the world a better place and if brands can help me figure out a way to do that and give me tools or give me a platform to tell my friends and get them enlisted and then make the world a better place then I'm gonna do that well, sure. And, and the way people self-identify with brands, right? I mean, even back in the day, the I'm a Mac, I'm a PC. You know, it was, there was the, the cool kid, Justin Long, and John Hodgman playing the other character. And it was really about, you know, who, what group are you part of? Not necessarily trying to sell uh, machinery based on speed or specs or things like that. And it was uh, really fascinating in terms of our relationship with brands in that way, for sure. Um, anything else that you want to share a little bit about maybe what's uh, coming up for Edelman uh, the rest of this year or next year that um, we'd love to know about? Sure. Well, we're, um, we're still doing earned brand uh, events. So you might uh, hear about an earned brand coming to your city, a city near you. Uh, we'll be doing those around the world. That study is in uh, 13 countries. And then the 2018 Trust Barometer is going into the field this fall. Wow. Um, and that should be incredibly fascinating. It'll be launched uh, January of next year at Davos. Um, and that, as I said, is going to be taking a deep dive at this whole notion of the media. What is going on? How are people really getting the news today? Um, and um, you know, to what extent are they checking uh, stories before they post them? How concerned should we be about fake news? Um, and in this era where media as an institution is so broken and experts are not trusted and CEOs are not trusted, what the heck can you do to break through and to, to be credible and to, you know, get information out there in a way that is responsible and authentic? So that's a real challenge. Um, and then there'll be some, uh, some studies focused on different sectors and so on coming out uh, over the course of next year as well, but those are the two big ones. Well, my hope too, and I think so much of, um, you know, like I said, I'm always fascinated to, to look at the study every year. And I'm also hoping that over time, um, as we start maybe seeing what's not working, you know, in, in government and media, uh, and maybe in other, you know, institutions as well, that we can start to uh, if we want to look to one another, that's great. And I would love it even if more if we could listen to one another more. Listen for learning, not listen for debate, but listen for understanding. And um, I think if we could do a lot more of that, and I think in many respects follow the lead of a lot of the findings of your trust barometer, we as a society would be a lot better off. So uh, thanks for the great work that you all do in that. And I think continuing to teach us all a little something uh, every year. So Tonya, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. It's incredible. You're so welcome, Leo. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. That's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y. 
www.thebrandingcoach.com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Cantrell. Hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 License.